Romans chapter 5, we're in verses 6 through 11 on the screens together. I will pick it up beginning in verse 6. If you'll read the odd number verses, I've got the even. Verse 6, Romans 5, verse 6, for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. That's in the present tense, by the way. It means he's doing it now. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more... Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Amen. Father God, please unpack our hearts. We're the ones that need you now to unpack our hearts, rearrange it. And Lord, make it new. Transform us, we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Church, we're looking at a message as we started out some time ago. We'll fill in some of the blanks from before, but we're looking at a message series titled, God for you. Not good for you, although that would be good for you, is for you to know that God for you answers every need in your life. God for you, according to the Bible, is exactly what you need. It doesn't matter how old, how young, it doesn't matter what your belief system might be today, you may have walked in here today of some certain uh, belief system or none at all. You might claim to be an atheist. I want you to know something. That according to God's Bible, his message to you is that right now, while we are still breathing, while we're still alive, God for you is for you to know his gospel truth, and his word of truth. So we've been going through Romans chapter 4 and 5 together, and as we looked at Romans 4, and as we're into Romans chapter 5, many have said, those in the uh, theological or theologians throughout history, they have made the comment regarding chapters 4 and 5 that this argument for the believer is the greatest document or treaty, these two chapters, on being a believer. Uh, What did God do? How can I be saved? Uh, What in fact is it, if I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that I possess? How should it affect my life? And I got to tell you, I actually, after going through so many commentaries and so many notes on my just my own time meditating on this and studying this, I have to tell you that I've been a Christian some 45 years, and just this week, uh, there's been a, a reawakening of an excitement about how radical you and I should be because of God's radical love for us. That, and I don't mean radical like, let's go scream. I'm talking about just radically loved. We are by the Almighty God. And you're going to hear... Uh, Some of that. We won't be able to finish all of the message today. What's new, right, to that? But we're going to get enough. We're going to get enough. Uh, But as we get into this, I want to give you some of what I believe God wants us to hear. That every thought of reconciliation that you and I might think about is deeply rooted in the fact that we as human beings must experience reconciliation in our own personal life. Now, I'm bringing this to you in what is known as an apologetic form, apologia, meaning this. I'm going to introduce to you something you already know about, but I'm going to expand it, arguing from the lesser to the greater, this way. That if it's important to you that your relationships are healthy, if it's important to you that your family gets along, that your marriage is working, and that you have a a core group of people, and you understand We've got a good thing going here. 
I want to challenge you by thinking, why is that important to you? Secondly is, what happens when that gets disrupted? Does it bother you? Does it bother you when your marriage is at, at odds? Does it, does it bother you when, when a, a, a child and a parent are split? Does it bother you? Of course it bothers you. If it doesn't bother you, honestly, with all due respect, you're sick. You've got something wrong mentally. You and I were designed to be reconciled. We were not designed to live apart. And our nation today and our culture today is poisoned because of unforgiveness and because of bitterness and not being reconciled. And that's just on the human plane. My challenge to you is where does that come from? If it's true in your life, and it is, I want to stress now that the reason why it's true is because you've been created in the image of God. That's why it's true in your life. You say, yeah, but I don't believe in God. But you still bear evidence of God's design upon your life, even though you deny his existence. Because we all share in that same thing. We want our relationships reconciled. And thirdly, that comes to us because God wants you to be reconciled to him. That's the ultimate. All of this now is to point you and I to what is eternal. What will last. In the book of Job, Job chapter 16, verse 21. And I don't know if you realize this or not. Many of you do. Good Bible students here today. The oldest book in the Bible is not Genesis. The oldest book in the Bible is the book of Job. It's the oldest book. Job in Job 16, 21 says, Oh, that one might plead for a man with God as a man pleads for his neighbor. Job was lamenting the fact that he sensed a great division between him and God. For those of us who are Christians, we know what that feels like and we know what it feels like to have that void removed or filled in. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you're still in that place today where you're wondering, yes, pastor, tell me. I would like to be able to meet up with God like a person meets with a friend. How, how does that happen? Well, you've come to the right place at the right time. Job cried out and said, oh, that someone might plead my case as it were before God. Well, we have an answer in that. His name is Jesus Christ. And in that great book, the book of Job, Job expresses his frustration. And that was all because of the power of sin. It's sin that has separated us from God. People hate to hear the word sin. You know that? And, and people are getting more fired up today than ever. You mentioned to somebody, you know, you need Jesus. Why do I need Jesus? Because you're a sinner. I can't believe you just insulted me. Oh, grow up. We're all, <laughs> we're all sinners, the Bible says, and we need him. And I said this recently, and somebody got a real kick out of it. And so I'll say it again. Everybody's talking about this and about that, and I made the comment a while back that we are all S-I-N positive. Did you test positive? <laughs> Did you test positive for this? Did you test positive for that? Let me tell you something right now. We don't have to test you. You don't have to test me. We are positive, S-I-N. We are all sin sick, and when Job cried out, is there someone to talk to? To God for me, like I can talk to my friend. Oh yes, the answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the savior from us being S-I-N positive. He's the one that delivers us from this void that separation from God creates. And we are in need of this great reconciliation. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 59 verse 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor is his ear heavy or deaf that he cannot hear, but your iniquities, sins, have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear you. Isn't that a tragic statement? That God will not listen until you get the sin issue dealt with. He's not interested in your morality. He's not interested in your religiosity. He doesn't care if you can talk Christianese. It doesn't matter to him. What matters to him is, has the sin issue been dealt with? Amen. And it's amazing because that picture of what I see in the book of Isaiah is that you see somebody talking and they're calling out 
in, in whatever condition, but they're calling, and, and God, God is just, he's just motionless. He's, he's, why? It's almost like someone is screaming in front of him, and, and they don't even exist. It doesn't mean he's not caring, does it? Think of it. That's not on him. That's on me. Because he's the one who says, oh, by the way, your sins have separated you from me. I want to hear you, and I want to rescue you. But your sins have separated you from me, and I cannot hear you, and so I cannot rescue you. So, Jack, well, then, what is the great answer to that? The answer is that you turn to God. This, listen, you turn to God so that he will listen to you. Well, how is that? That great mediator, Jesus. He's the one that fills the void, that bridges that gap, and becomes our voice, as it were, to the Father. We pray to the Father in the Holy Spirit. Listen, in the name of Jesus Christ. And what he did on the cross was reconcile us to himself. We'll hear all about that pretty soon. We'll get started here in a minute. (laughs) The Bible tells us in Psalm 47, verses 7 and 8, and you're going to see the reference on the notes, that it's also mentioned in Hebrews 10, Verse 7, why is that? Because it's quoted exactly the same. The author of the book of Hebrews quotes the psalmist. Behold, I have come, speaking of the Messiah. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Did you know that was one of the missions of Jesus Christ himself? I have come to do thy will, O God. That's the great answer. Is that you and I have someone right now today to represent us before the very throne room of God, and it's Jesus Christ. How are we reconciled to God? Through Jesus Christ. That's the answer, but we need to know why that's true. So church, God for you, number one, we just got into the start of it last time together. It was this, from the beginning, verses six through eight, God for you, from the beginning, we learned this. And verse six, that he knew our weaknesses. I'm so glad about this, listen up. He knew our weaknesses, He didn't abandon us in our weaknesses. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. What a tremendous statement. If you think about it in a a more um, sanctified, sarcastic way, if you read that carefully, watch this. In a sense, almost read it backwards. Well, regarding the ungodly, Christ died for them at just the right time. Why? We're without strength. We had no hope. So all of a sudden, when I look at verse 6 and I realize to qualify for his benefits, I've got, I've got to come to the awakening that I'm an ungodly individual, that without Christ, I'm ungodly. And I love how thorough God's word is because people don't want to hear this. You got up this morning, you had breakfast, you got all dressed, you came here, and you sat down, and I called you ungodly. Hey, listen, if you understand God's desire to reconcile you to himself, you're going to want to get in line to confess uh, that you're ungodly. You're going to say, wait a minute, his love is upon the ungodly? Yep, sign me up. Wait a minute, he's the one that when I was still yet ungodly that he loved me? Yes, sign me up. If he saves sinners, then save me. Then sign me up. In our weakness, the very God of the universe is for you by providing the way out of our condition. We take vitamins, supplements, do we not? If we're sick, we go to the doctor, or we used to, do we not? (laughs) You're supposed to exercise, do we not? Or did we? (laughs) Should I? Uh, We do these things, why? To better our life in the here and now in the moment. So to speak, is there some sort of spiritual application that I can take? Is there a spiritual supplement? Yeah, it's understanding this. Get the knowledge of knowing that God has come to you and I in our weaknesses by presenting himself for the ungodly. What a remarkable truth that is. And it means that God has an eternal plan. He, God, thank God for this. The Bible teaches us that throughout all eternity, God knew He knew our weakness before you were ever born. Charles Spurgeon says that he 
He said, I believe in the foreknowledge of God and the predestination of God. He said, I believe that God knew me throughout all eternity, and that's true of all of us. He said, I'm so grateful. Now, he got a little, it's a little cute here, he's a little sassy, but he's, watch this. He says, I'm so grateful that Jesus knew me before I was ever born, and he died on the cross for my sins, because if he would have known me after I was born, he never, <laughs> he never would have died for me. Now, that's a cute statement, but it's theologically bad. God knew you before universe, Jupiter, Mars was ever established. That's hard for us to fathom. You and I reject things that are weak. You and I reject things that are flawed. I was reading this week um, about Darwin and his doctrine, and somehow I got to wiggle this stuff into some sermons coming up, man, I got to tell you. I had no idea. Now, see, I'm going to do it. And I was just, I can't do it. (laughs) We'll talk about how Darwin was a profound, in his own words, racist. Like, you can't believe. He believed all black people should be removed from earth, from the earth. Even dark skinned, he he said. I'm going to give you his his own quotes. And uh, Margaret Sanger and Adolf Hitler picked up on that, by the way. And a few others. That, that's a sermon for some other day, I think. Maybe now. Who knows? I don't know. But uh, in my weakness, I digress. The second thing, church, is this, is that he knew our value in verse 7. Now, this is an interesting thing to say because God knew our value. Let's be honest. We run around as a human culture saying and promoting our own value. Oh, you're so wonderful. You're amazing. We have to watch out with this, by the way. When we raise our kids, we can kind of overdo it sometimes. Look at you, buddy. You can do anything. And that's encouragement. That's nice. But when you go overboard, you you basically, if if the kid doesn't experience reality and all all he hears is how great thou art, then (laughs) what happens is the little guy grows up thinking that the whole world belongs to him and that he can do anything he wants. It's okay to encourage your kid, but don't turn him into a little god right? And so in doing that, we, of course we have value, but our problem is, oh boy, here it comes. Our value is uh, we love ourselves too much. It's not a healthy love, but we overvalue ourselves, but we begin valuing ourselves in a wrong way. We don't know the definition of that. You say, no, I need more self-esteem. No, you do not. That's a psychological band-aid on a big spiritual issue. Well, my my therapist told me I need need more uh, self-esteem. No, here's the deal. You 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 want to find out how much you're esteemed? Open up the Bible and find out that God died for the ungodly and he saved sinners. Let's be honest about this. You want to know your value? Your value is the God of creation loves you. That God brought you into this world and he's going to preserve you. He's, right, even now he's given you the gospel of his truth. That Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again from the dead. You are all valuable to God. That doesn't mean you strut around and have people bow to you. It means you walk humbly with your God. It's absolutely amazing. He knew our value. Verse 7 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. That truth is manifested in life, and we talked about that. We don't need to belabor it. The value that we place, it may be misplaced, it may be insufficient, but it happens within us because we're fallen creatures. But we can even admit that there's someone who is beyond us or better than us or loved that we would even entertain giving our lives for them. And I gave you the analogy of the soldiers, and we talked about that before, but it's about the expense, technically, of love. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, 1 John 3, 16, by this we know love, because Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. On the count of three, say us. One, two, three. Us. We have no problem saying that. On the count of three, say me. One, two, three. Me. We have a problem with that. You know why we have a problem like this? 
I, have, I can totally get it that God loved you so much that he would die for you. I get it. The problem is me. Because when I wake up to this truth that we are re- exposing right now, that Christ died for the ungodly, the moment I begin to embrace this truth, yes, I, I am. I have lustful thoughts, angry thoughts, wicked thoughts. I fill in the blank. Yes, I, 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 I guess I am ungodly. The next moment, if not handled right, we will immediately crash into a place of depression and we'll believe that everybody else Jesus died for on the cross except for ourselves. Why? Because we've looked in the mirror now. The Bible shines in our face our incredible weakness and our, in, our complete inability to save ourselves. And God says, look, I value you. And we look in the mirror and we see this hit, hideous monster that we call me. And in that second, it is so mandatory that in that very second, you get that emotion under, the, under thought right now and you realize I am looking at myself in the word of God and it exposes me. It lays me wide open. And oh, what a wretch. Didn't Peter do that when they were out fishing? Do you remember that? And Jesus performs his miracle and Peter freaks and he says, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. That was a great moment for Peter. And it's a great moment for you to realize, oh my goodness, I'm a sinful man. And the next breath that comes from the heart of God is for him to say to you right now, I loved you so much, I went to the cross for you. We can believe it for others, but listen, you got to believe it for yourself. When God's word says it for you, you got to pick it up and make it your own. Jesus Christ is a personal savior. You need to make this gospel personal. The great Puritans of old would always say this. I love it. That we should preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Isn't that a great word? Think about that. Every morning you get up, you ought to think the thought, Jesus Christ died for me. Lord, I trust you. I believe you. I love you. Let's live today, Jesus. Powerful and true. The value, it's remarkable. It's beyond our comprehension. According to the Bible, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, listen up if you don't know this, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah concerning the Messiah, listen to this, 543 years before Jesus, no, excuse me, 743 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The prophet Isaiah said concerning the Messiah that would be born in Bethlehem. When you look at him physically, there would be no beauty or attributes about him that would cause you to think that he's special. Did you know that if Jesus, if you, if you walked by Jesus 2,000 years ago, he didn't glow. He didn't glow in the dark. If I was writing the story, I would have had him born at the Jerusalem Hilton, not a stable, (laughs) that he rode around in in a caravan of black camels and black donkeys with little antennas on the rear end of those, with guys running alongside with dark glasses. (laughs) And that he would have glowed in the dark. No, according to the Bible, he looked just absolutely common. Isn't that kind of wild? See, yeah, but didn't you have that halo that we have always in the paintings? No. No. Physically. So my study led me down this path. This is TMI. Are you ready for this? This is TMI. According to the March issue of Psychology Today in 2014, the article was listed under Beauty is in the, Bi- Beauty is in the Eye of the Beholder. We've all heard that term before, right? Are you guys with me? Yes. So beauty's in the eye of the beholder. We all heard that, grew up hearing that. This article went on to say that there's four key elements to relationships. And whichever one is stressed most or all together depends the level of our relationship and with who. So for example, these four things, and I don't know if we have it on the screen or not, it doesn't matter, you can write it down. Number one is physical attraction. That's not a surprise to you, right? 
if you're in a crowded room and you see somebody across the room, it's possible, most common, that one of the things that grabs your attention is physical attraction. That's not to be repented of, people. You got awful quiet in here. God designed you that way. You say, I'm so ugly, pastor, nobody would want me. Not according to the will of God. There is somebody in the world. You just got to, you just. <laughs> Physical attraction. What you may find interesting about this is that we are physically attracted to one another. So why am I attracted to that person? Look at that. I can't get my eyes off that person. And you share that with your friend or whatever. And you're like, look at that person. It's so attractive. And the person next to your friend goes, who, that? <laughs> you ever had that happen? Who, that? What, that? What's going on? And they analyzed this. It's fascinating. They analyzed it. Guess what it comes down to? Mathematics. Truly, math. That the way that your mind works is that when you see somebody, you, you personally see someone. For example, you saw my wife giving an announcement on the screen up there. And I told, I told some guys, I said, you know what? We, I don't want people dating one another on staff, but I'm taking her home. <laughs> the more I tell people not to date on staff, the more they wind up dating, I think, too. So you know what? <laughs> But, but hey, here, here's the thing. It's math. Unbeknownst to us, oh, wow, the attractiveness takes place. Right now, there's something called facial recognition. Computers do it. But computers do it without a heart. You have been designed by God to look at someone, and you can determine that's an attractive person. That's your assessment. Based upon the way that your eyes and your brain determine the value based on a mathematical equation that takes place inside of you. Shape, geometry, all of it regarding physical attraction, designed by God. There's a reason why I'm bringing this up. Watch. Number two, emotional how compatible you are emotionally with someone. Meaning this, you can, you can walk into a room, sit down next to somebody and be taking a test or be involved in a project and not even see them, but you're talking and you are working on a project together and you listen to how she thinks, um, humor, how funny he is, whatever it might be, and there is this emotional connection where they make me laugh or they, I like, the, I like the way that they express themselves. Have you seen them? No, they sit next to me, but I've never looked at them. What's going on? Something that God has designed in you at work. He's wired you this way. Third thing, intellectual cohesion. What does that mean? When you are uh, talking or you are involved in a project, by the way, it's some of these elements which makes office romance so dangerous. You're working with somebody in their environment. You're sharing an issue which causes number four. I'll talk about four in a moment. That stuff's got to be guarded, right place, right all of that properness. But watch out. All these things left alone to themselves could spell disaster. All of them put in the right place, led by God. It's wonderful. But when you hear how someone's mind works and you can relate to each other and you've got these things about intelligence, whatever that level may be is irrelevant. It's that you meet there. And then the fourth thing, some have argued that this is most important of all, life experiences. You can have somebody who's a... a a millionaire living in New York City on the same flight that somebody is poor from South Central. And the airplane goes down on the South Pacific and they grab a raft and they float somewhere to a deserted island. They, they help each other get out of the raft and they're there and they wind up working through struggles and she's as beautiful as can be and he's as ugly as sin. <laughs> she's as rich as Croesus and he is a pauper. 
Then they get rescued by the Coast Guard, and she goes back to New York, and he goes back to L.A., and guess what happens? They wind up missing each other sick, and they wind up getting married. What, what happened? What happened? They, got, they were emotionally bonded in a life, a life experience, and any combination of those things lead to a relationship that works. Guess what? God wants you and I to know him just like this, But there's only one way to know him just like this. In the true sense of it. See, what I just gave you is a broken operation of it. God made it perfect. And he wants you and I to know him exactly like this. That every day in our life, it's as though Christ is with us. And he is. And we need to practice his presence. Every day in our lives, there's that emotional interaction with God, which speaks of our now... how. Compatible we are with God. We're no longer at war with God. We're, as it was with Abraham, friends with God. And then there's the intellectual cohesion between you and God. I love this one because it's by being in this word that causes our minds to expand. Our brains to expand. I am very jealous about the Christian community. What I mean by that is this. The Christian should be the smartest possible person on the block. Christians should be shaking up the world with thought and with challenge, with insights and understanding. Why? Because the whole thing's rigged. We've got the Bible. Our God's on the throne. We were created in his image. We should be absolutely the best scientists. We should be the best teachers. We should be the best parents, the best pilots, the best you name it. The best doctors should be the Christians. By the way, when you look at history, that's exactly what you find. Go and study. Just one topic alone. You go study and find out how Europe and the United States got rid of slavery. It wasn't by atheists. Remarkable. So this is where we pick it up. That was all the introduction from last week. (laughs) Verse 8. Verse 8. We see the third argument in this. uh, God for you from the beginning is this. Is that he knew our condition. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Church family, please look at that. Look at that verse, will you? Take a picture of it if you have to. Memorize it. But God, but God demonstrates his own love. Not someone else's love. God didn't send someone else to represent his love. His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, you kind of, listen, do you kind of feel a little knife turn right there? Or how about, how about this? You may feel it right like that, still sinners. But once you come to know Jesus, we don't get that stab anymore. We just go, oh yeah. (laughs) So why do you say that? Well, as we'll see in a moment, If he says he loved me while I was an absolute nincompoop, jerk, God-rebellious, unbelieving bum, if he died for me like that, now that I believe that he died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead and I want to love him with all my heart, oh, then this just gets better. Because if he loved me like that, Now I can have a love with him that transcends anything I can ever imagine. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is one of the most profound theological statements in all of the scriptures. And if today you're representing some cult or some Eastern mysticism, maybe you're here today and you're you're an embracer of some strange religion, whatever, I got news for you. Whatever you represent, I don't care what cult you're from, or what new age group you might represent, you ain't got that verse in your writings. None of the gods of paganism ever had the audacity to say that. No, in fact, by the way, all the gods of paganism and all the gods of of the world that men have created, they want you to die for them. By the way, listen, all the other gods that are fake, they want you to defend them. Listen, if our God needs our defense, we got the wrong one. We need his defense. (laughs) How dare you say that about my God? I'm going to... Oh, calm down. If you've got to get riled up 
Because somebody says something about your God, you got the wrong God. If somebody says, listen, just to make a point, the God that I worship, he's the only one that gets cussed at every day. Do you hear me? When's the last time you heard somebody there working on the job say, Ow! Buddha! It's never happened. In fact, you can be a Buddhist on the construction site and, Ow! Jesus! Right? Isn't that interesting? No one trips and falls over and skins their knee and shouts Muhammad. <laughs> He's the one and only. And he makes these promises. Amen. He says, hey, everybody, I, got, I, I demonstrated my love toward you. I wrote this down maybe because I was thinking about last week and we celebrated our nation's birthday, but it dawned on me. You know what? Romans 5.8 is our declaration of independence. Amen. That's our declaration. Of, what, how can you be so different? How can you be f confident about heaven? Oh, because God demonstrated his own love toward me and that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me? That's my declaration of independence. That's what I stand on. The word demonstrate means this. It means to commend. It means to introduce or to announce. Watch this. It means to put on exhibit. It means to approve of. It means to display. I love that. God displayed his love toward us. The cross is the display of God's love. Yesterday, Lisa and I were out and this young girl had a Big cross on her neck. It was a big cross. It was more, it's like an inch and a half, two inches. It was big. And I said to her, I appreciate your cross. And she goes, huh, what, what, what? And then it dawned on me, she doesn't know what I'm talking about. It's, it's jewelry. Right? Oh, I have faith. Do you now? Can you tell me about your faith? Christian, our response should be this. If somebody says, do you have faith? Oh, I have faith in the one who, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. That's how God demonstrated his love toward me. Amen. That should be our answer, church. If you, if you have a cross, if you've got a sticker, if you've got the t-shirt, if you've got the book, but you don't know the answer, then all you've got is religion. But do you have him? And God says, I've demonstrated my love. Now, this is incredibly uh, powerful because uh, the word demonstrate here means that God has not missed some place in demonstrating his love toward us. Now, those of you who know your Bible, you know Romans chapter 1 says the whole world is without an excuse. They have no excuse because he said, I've shown myself to the world. See, and we always do this. Well, what about the guy that's in the jungles of the Amazon? What about that poor guy who's never heard the gospel? That always comes from people who are not Christians who are trying to deflect, which cracks me up because all of a sudden they care about a guy in Amazon. <laughs> or, at, or at Amazon. Um, <laughs> so number one, I would say, uh, stop worrying about the guy down in, Amazon, in the Amazon because the Bible says God is speaking to the guy that's at Amazon. God is speaking to him so that he's without excuse. His display of his love is so pronounced in the human heart that he's announcing, you're a sinner, you need saving, you need love. You have looked for love in all the wrong places and you've come up empty. You still got that big hole in your heart, don't you? C.S. Lewis says, why is it that those who are of the elite, those who are of wealth, those who are of status, all wind up the same at the end like the poor man without Christ, empty? empty. In Romans chapter 8, verse 7, Romans 8, verse 7, the Bible says, because the carnal mind, the unredeemed mind, the mind that you and I have before we meet Jesus, is at war against God, enmity, at war. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. People, that 
latter end of verse 7 is reason why you and I give the gospel or in a message like this. Listen, you're sitting here right now and there's a whole lot more people watching right now and you might say, well, today's message blessed me. Well, let me tell you, for every blessing somebody says about the message, there's people who write and say, you know what? You ought to... Why would happen? Because the carnal mind is at war with God. I could have been a robot up here quoting scripture and the letters still would have come in. Because it's not that they're attacking my shirts or my pants or my nose or whatever it is. They're writing in attacking what they felt, 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 felt when they heard that verse. So they're, they're confusing me with what's happening between them and God. Take me out of it. I had nothing to do with it. God's word jumped up off the page, flew into your face, and got down in your heart and shook you up. And you're like, what happened to me? Nothing, nothing. Except that God loves you. God wants you to come to him. And he called you ungodly. <laughs> well, it really offends me. That's beautiful. That's a good thing. We have slumped so much as a culture. You know, there's a, there's a, there is a sanctified offense. The gospel brings an offense. Did you know that? We said, no, everything that offends, that's wrong. No, mm -mm. Jesus loves sinners. That's offensive. How's that offensive? Because it implies we're sinners. Can't have that. You don't need to hear this again, but why not? <laughs> John 3, 16. If you ever watched a football game, you've got this memorized. <laughs> For God so loved the world. Some of you, you need to scratch out world and put your name over that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, only glorified, one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have, uh, but have everlasting life. Church family, listen. You guys, we've become so accustomed to that that we could fall asleep in the reading of it. And that's sad because if you're hearing it for the first time today, you're saying, what? I thought the God of the Bible was sharpening an ax to take me out. Listen, he hasn't come yet in judgment. The day that Christ returns in the second coming, that's the day he brings out the ax. That day hasn't come, friend. The clock's ticking. And this is what he is saying. Whoever. Nothing snooty about that, huh? Nothing uppity about it? Whoever. Some people, I don't know if that's good. What do you mean, whoever? Whoever. Well, the woman a few seats over to me looked like she just came off the streets of L.A., prostitution or something. Maybe she's a whoever. Amen. Well, that guy over there, he looks so self-righteous and smug and arrogant. Maybe he's a whoever. You hear what I'm saying? What if we lived 2,000 years ago and we were following Jesus? Would you like to have done that? Could you have handled it? Because if you're following Jesus 2,000 years ago... There's priests following him and all of their religious garb and then you're looking at your clothes and you're feeling kind of inadequate. And then there's people like you, which is fine. And then there's common folk and street people and prostitutes and pimps and whatever. And they're following Jesus too. Have you read the Gospels? What nature or what status of life didn't follow him? It seems as though there's a representation of everybody. The book of Acts tells us that even those within Caesar's household, his family, became believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Love it. God gave. Gifted. In Psalm 139, verse 17, Psalm 139, verse 17 and 18, it says, How precious are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! That means there's a whole lot of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. Wow. Did you know that about God? His love for you? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
The fact that the Bible tells us that eternity, we will know this. I don't want to bum you out, but it's a theological fact. When Jesus Christ returns, every visage, by the way, of you and I being sinners are removed from us. Did you know that? When you and I are resurrected from the dead, there is no manifestation left over whatsoever reminder that you and I were sinners. We will know, based on the book of Revelation, that we were redeemed from every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation of the earth. You and I will know that. But it's only Jesus Christ, the Bible says in the Bible, that he bears the scars of his crucifixion. Did you know that? The Bible says that when Christ comes back to Israel in the second coming, they will say to him, where did you receive these wounds? And he will say to them, I received these wounds in the house of my friends. That's a reference to the nation, the people of Israel. Remarkable. Remarkable. Awesome. But the fact that the Bible tells us that in eternity past, eternity past, think about that. This is a weird concept for us, but that means in the mind of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God's, God's not human. The Son became a human for us. God in eternity past. You and I think of time, past, present, future. So when we talk about eternity as humans, we have to say in eternity past, in this aspect, listen, God knew that the entire universe would be plunged into sin and the damages of sin because of Adam and Eve's fall. And God knew that before he created this earth. And you and I have a hard time with that because we would say, that was dumb. Why would he let that happen when he knew it was going to go goofy? This is the very point to expose and to display the depth of his love that he's demonstrated toward us. Because see, you and I, we can only love this thick. If we think something's going to go bad, I'm going to save myself some grief. And I'm going to get out of that. If you have any doubt, if God's going to finish the work that he started within you, get rid of the doubt now. Because once he has started a work in you, he's going to absolutely complete it. But it's been so rough. Hang in there. He will not quit. He's not going to give up. He's not going to stop. He started a work in your life. He's going to finish it off. And in eternity, it's not that he just saved us. But he did so in a premeditated fashion. Knowing that we would exercise our freedoms in a bad way. He gave us freedoms anyway. Freedom of choice. I'll share this as fast as I can. People have a hard time with this. When I say this, I get letters. Just don't, I'm, look, I'm backed up. I've been on vacation, then I got sick, I got letters. I, uh, here, here, here's the thing. In his eternal state, knowing all that would happen, didn't have to think twice or see if there's another way. He saw the way man would go and he kept writing the book, so to speak, to us. Meaning that he engineered within you the ability of choice whereby out of all of his creation, there's only one, and that is the human, that can exercise in little what he is in perfection. Sovereignty. God gave it to you. You don't have sovereignty because you're cool. You've got sovereignty because God built it into the computer. You're the computer. God gave you that ability. So don't, don't brag about it. But he gave you that ability, but then he says, do the right thing with it. Anybody you have kids? Then your kids have sovereignty? Aren't they in your family? They bear your last name, for starters. You feed them from time to time. <laughs> they're, they're there. They've been given those responsibilities, but they are responsible for what they do with them. God did the same thing to you and I. 
And he knew what Adam and Eve were going to do. God's love to be demonstrated to you to know that he'll never leave you or forsake you. That he died on the cross for you. Goes so deep. He's so committed. God for you is so awesome that he didn't have to revert to plan B. He knew he would die for you. So that throughout all eternity, he would display his love for you. You will never hear, ever, God say to any child in this family, get out. He'll never say it. He'll never say it. It's not in him. John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Isn't that precious? So listen to this. I'm going to have to wrap this up. But you say, what's the proof of this? Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him. What does it say? Before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. That's a mouthful. That's a heartful. That's incredible. That is absolutely awesome. Before the universe was ever created, God had this. 1 John 4, verse 9. 1 John 4, verse 9 says, In this... The love of God was manifested toward us. That's on display. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God. Watch everyone. And that, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, atonement for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. But listen, real big punchline here. I love the fact that the Bible says God loved us first. And then we responded to his love. I'm so, listen, for those of you who are thinking, well, you know, God loves me because he knew that I I love him so much. No, man, you got that all flipped around. Because first of all, if you want to push your theology, it goes this way. As long as you love God, God loves you and you're going to heaven and you're in heaven if you're there now. And it's all great as long as you love God. You see, the foundation is your love for God. You need to love God more. No. The more I wake up to his love for me, that's how I fall in love with him more. So check this out. Think of all those things. Think of the attraction. Think of the intellectual cohesion. Think of the life experience. Think of all these things with God. The fact is this. How, Pastor, will will God love me tomorrow? (laughs) Will you still love me tomorrow? (laughs) Tonight you're mine, but what? No, listen. God loved you first. Because that's a fact, because that's true, he says my love never changes, my my love never ends. And our foundation for our eternity is based upon the fact and, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's as frail as God loving you. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Is it frail? Not at all. I said that sarcastically. His love for you will never end. I'm talking to the Christian right now. If you're not a Christian, he loves you, but you're going to hell. He wants you to stop that. You should know that. Just because he loves you doesn't, get, doesn't mean you get to go in. He, his, his love for you should cause you to turn from your life of self and come to him. Amen. And you need to embrace the fact that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and become a follower of Jesus. But hallelujah, it's based upon his love for you, not your love for him. We fall in love with him more and more with every bit of attraction, with every bit of experience, with every bit of cohesion. The more we know him, the more we go, Wow. I thought I knew him last year. He's amazing. And that's going to happen, by the way, forever. And um, we're going to do this. We have, we have a few seconds left. 
Verses 9 through 10 is our second point. And God, it's this that he continues on. With the work of transforming you. Look at verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. Much more. Circle the words much more. Much more. Chapter 5 is known as the much more chapter. I kid you not. Are you ready? Write it down. Are you guys awake? Yeah. Come on, come on. We got to finish this. <laughs> verse, verse, chapter 5, uh, verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Much more. Romans 5.15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, that's Adam and Eve, uh, be dead, much more. The grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abound unto many. Romans 5, verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more. They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. That is Jesus Christ. Almost there. Here we go. Romans 5, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. In other words, the law intensifies our sin. But where sin abounds, grace did what, church? Much more abound. Much more. 2 Corinthians 3.9. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, he's talking about the Ten Commandments, the law of God. If the ministry of condemnation, it did nothing, it couldn't save you, it just told you how wrong you were. The ministry of righteousness, that's the New Testament, exceeds, what's the words? Much more in glory. 2 Corinthians 3, 11. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Hebrews 7, 22. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety, a guarantee for a better covenant. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall, listen, shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, that means no sin, to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. How awesome is that? The Bible tells us because of what Jesus has done for us, we are justified. We are, I, we are so undeserving. Let's stand, but we, are, we, we sense that. I'm so undeserved. God calls me justified. Yes, not because you're so fantastic. It's because he is. Dear friend, I know you got theology this morning from a fire hose. But I got to tell you, you, need to, you leave this building today and you know something. Take this away. But God demonstrated his love toward me and that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Today, friend, if you do not know that, you need to make that decision today. You can say right now, right where you're standing, Jesus, I want to know you like that. I want to know you as the one who demonstrated your love for me, that while I'm still a sinner, you died for me? Open my eyes to that God. That's the God I want to know. That's the faith I want to put my commitment to. He's worthy.